Hey, Triangle Lovers, welcome to Making Moves, hosted by the Rachel Kendall team, where we will explore together the top restaurants, community hotspots, and events in our area. Let's make some moves. It's Making Moves, and our guest today is something a little bit different, and some might say it is real estate-centered, but I'm going to say it is still triangle-focused about the growth and just the wonderful economy that we have. So we have Mid-Street Mergers and Acquisitions. Eric Sullivan is here to speak with us. Welcome, Eric. Thank you so much for having me. Happy to be here. Awesome. Well, so when I was first introduced to you by one of our colleagues, uh, Anna, who's our digital media specialist, she said, you know, I'm not sure if this would be something that we should do on Making Moves, but the more we spoke about it, the more I really thought this is such a great opportunity to share how businesses come to the Triangle. So tell us a little bit about what Midstreet does and what your role within the company is. Absolutely. So Midstreet helps business owners in the Triangle and really all throughout North Carolina, but a lot in the Triangle, uh, sell their companies. So generally companies that are doing between one and 25 million in revenue are the ones that we're working with. Okay. So this would be your manufacturing company, maybe your HVAC company um, would contact us. The owner got to a point in their life where they decided they're ready to stop running the business for a multitude of reasons. People come to us for a lot of reasons, mm-hmm. but one way or another, they decide I'm ready to be done. Mm -hmm. And so they put their business on the market, right? They have us market the company and get it out to potential buyers. And then people from all over the country contact us to purchase the business and often relocate to the area as well. Wow. So what you're doing is really bringing in new talent. It's bringing in... um, future organizations for the Triangle to help with employment and to just create that great commerce and space for everybody. So how long have you been there? So I've been with Midstreet for five years, and I've been selling businesses for that period of time. And really what we do is we we kind of support the legacy of business ownership for companies that are already out there operating. So Mm -hmm. a business has been in business for 25 years and the owner, when they get to a certain age, they really have a choice. They can either retire and close the doors and tell their employees Mm -hmm. sayonara, or they can try and find somebody to take it over. And generally that's what we're doing when we sell it is we're looking for that new person to come from out of state or just anywhere really Mm -hmm move to the area, purchase the business, and continue that legacy, continue to operate the company for years to come. Yeah, and I think that's a responsible business owner is, you know, we don't always have people within our families to pass down family-owned companies, and or maybe the people in your family aren't interested in continuing that legacy. And that's the case a lot of the time. Right, so you have to have a succession plan, and, you know, being in real estate and being, uh, and being affiliated with a locally owned independent firm, I relate that very similarly to the Rachel Kendall team because our firm was created and designed to have a succession plan so that that legacy can continue to go. And the culture that was created by Rachel and Dan can maintain so that we never have to say, you know what, we're not going to be here tomorrow, right? We're going to be here for the long haul. And we've got the infrastructure and the succession plan created so that that can happen. So when I heard that business model, I was like, well, that's kind of special to me because I'm involved in a business where that was created. And I would feel very um, upset if I had to look at agents and say, you know what, they're done. They're not gonna be here anymore. And I think that's important for people coming into new companies to always understand is, if it's a small owned, a small locally owned business, those are great questions to ask. So are you a real estate agent or what exactly is, what does that mean I help people buy and sell? How, yeah. does, how do you define that? So I am a North Carolina real estate agent. Okay. I have my license, been licensed for four years. And um, what it means to sell a business is, you know, it, it's funny because when you think of selling a business, you, you think, well, what, you know, you sell the physical building, you know, everybody sort of attaches a business to the building mm-hmm. just naturally. Right. You show up there it's the and, asset, right? Exactly. It's one of the assets. But when it comes time to sell a business, there's, there's a lot of different assets that are for sale. So if you look around the building that we're in today, you have you know, cubicles, we've got computers, mm-hmm. we've got desks, chairs. That's the equipment that the business needs to operate, right? Mm-hmm. So that's a separate asset from the business. And that's one of the assets that we help people sell. Uh, but really, when you sell a business, what you're looking at is how much income 
can that company produce? And then you take that income that the company's producing on an annual basis, Mm -hmm. you look back a couple of years, you take a weighted average where you sort of apply a a weight to each year, and then you apply a multiple to Mm -hmm. that income, and that establishes what the company is worth. Mm -hmm. So when you buy a company, what you're really buying and sometimes real estate can be included in this, what you're really buying is the promise of a future income stream Mm -hmm. that's created by the company. Right. So you could theoretically sell the Rachel Kendall team to a buyer who is not going to purchase the building. They're just going to purchase the rights to the business, the equipment, Mm -hmm. the tables, the chairs, uh, and continue to operate it the same way that you've been operating it or, or the owners have been operating it in the future for years to come, but lease the building instead of purchase it. Yeah. And you mentioned that you started in marketing. So where does marketing play into all of this? How how do people find you? What I mean, this is one of those things. You hear about franchises. Mm-hmm. We chatted about that a few minutes ago. Franchises are, you know, a little bit more corporate, a little easier to find. You can go to the website of Hungry Howie's or Chick-fil-A or wherever and start working through the process of obtaining a franchise. But how do you market for selling a business or if you're the potential of buyer of that business and you're just a person on the street. Where yeah. do they go to look? So it's a it's interesting if you compare it to the real estate world. We've got, you know, in the real estate world you have an MLS mm-hmm. and that MLS is then kind of sent out to a lot of different websites, Zillow, realtor.com, right, you know, you know all those. Mm-hmm. In business sales, there are a couple of specific websites that the the brokers who sell businesses have to decide where they want to put them. And so if you are looking for a business to buy, my recommendation would be to go to biz buy sell. Okay. That's B I Z B U Y S E L L dot com. That's probably the best known place to buy or sell a business. Um, outside of that, generally the way people find us is they look around online, they type in, you know, where to buy a business in North Carolina. <laughs> or so your how, SEO on your website better be good. <laughs> exactly. It's it's so important. And, yeah. and that's kind of where I came into the company is I had just a ton of knowledge about marketing and you know, video, photo, SEO, mm-hmm. blog writing. That was my sort of career before coming to Midstreet. And so I brought all those skills to Midstreet. And then my um, my boss or the, the president of Midstreet, Jeff Baxter, said, you're great with all these marketing things, but really your skills are with people. Mm-hmm. And so that's where I need you to go. I need, I need you to sort of begin learning those skills that you need to help us sell businesses because that's where you're going to be strongest for the team. Wow. That's awesome to have a mentor that gave you that kind of guidance and shameless plug. I talk about this a lot in each of our podcasts is that I think it's so important to identify a culture that you can really be able to advance because you you never know you could be 25 and walk into your career or you could be 35 and walk into your career but you got to be open to that and surround yourself with people that are there and invested in your skills and want to grow you um, so I think that's really awesome so you started in marketing what brought you to the triangle I've actually lived in the Triangle since I was two years old. Okay. So my family. So moved really, here. you haven't left the Triangle That's like right. so many of us. We decided, you know what, this is a great place to live, and we're not leaving. And I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> That's yeah. right. Yeah, yeah, I love the Triangle. I've, I've lived really all around. I've lived in Cary. I've lived in Durham. I've lived in Raleigh, Wake Forest. And I, I took a little time out in Charlotte, too, for college. Okay. All right. Great. Yeah. And I, I've always said that the Triangle's a couple years behind Charlotte. Mm. And you've been in an environment for the past five years to really see the impact of what businesses are doing to our economy and our community. So give me an idea about what you've seen in terms of our trends that are coming into the Triangle and the businesses that you're seeing shifting. Uh, just a little bit of the pulse of the market right now. Business is strong yeah. in the triangle. I it it's always extremely surprising to me when we put so when a when a business owner comes to us and they want our help selling the company, when we put it out online for, you know, the country mm-hmm. basically to see, it's astounding how many people contact us and say, is this in the triangle? You know, is this located in Raleigh or is this ro- located in that area? Yeah, I mean we hear about large corporations, Apple Google, but you're not you're not working with that level. And, mm. you know, I think that's something that people in our community need to be aware of, especially as it relates to real estate home sales is it's a trickle down effect. Okay, we get this notoriety of having these big corporations come in. 
And then now we've got the mid-levels that That's are right. coming into you. And what do those look like? What kind of jobs are going to be coming to our community as a result of new businesses coming in? And we sell businesses all over North Carolina. So okay. we, we get to see what it's like in different geographic areas. And I can tell you flat out, when we have a company in the triangle that's for sale, it gets more attention than those that don't. Mm -hmm. And everybody's calling us asking for, do you have anything in the Raleigh area? Do you have anything near Cary? Mm -hmm. You know, that's where people want to be. And it, it's a lot of things. The school systems here are phenomenal. Mm -hmm. If you look at the triangle, just from a geographic standpoint, you compare it to more established cities around the country. Mm -hmm. It's really unique in the sense that we have three major universities all within a 30, 40 mile radius of one another. And so that just draws in so much commerce because mm -hmm. everybody's competing for that high talent, right? Everybody wants the, those high talent individuals who are going to be coming from those schools. Right. And that's a very unique aspect of the triangle market, at least in my opinion, when I mm -hmm. look at it. We've got UNC, NC State, Duke. Those are Plus great the schools. private schools, Plus Meredith private College, schools. Peace University. I mean, and it's, really good public schools as well. Mm -hmm. And so that it just attracts so many high talented people to the area, which you guys are seeing right now. I mean, the, the prices for homes are flying through the roof, right. and that's a big part of it. Right. So, you know, and when I think of the triangle, I, I, I have to remember to think about the contiguous counties of Wake County. So when you are you seeing that more businesses are open to um, Johnston County or Halifax, uh, Granville, like what are you seeing in terms of being spread out or is it still really primarily focused in the Wake County market, Durham County? People are okay being a little bit far out, right? If you're within 45, so if we're selling a business and it's within 45 minutes of the Triangle area, mm -hmm. people are fine with that. Yeah. You know, well, and all that means closer. is that if they're if they're comfortable being the business that's 45 minutes outside of the county, the main Raleigh market, mm -hmm. then that means people are going to be willing to live 45 minutes, which is yep. the spread that I believe that we will see in something that we look at a lot on the Rachel Kendall team is where are our home sales going to come? when these businesses get pulled out a little bit further. Right in the next 20 years. That's right. And if you, one of the interesting things is if you look in the corridors that lead from, you know, downtown Raleigh out to Nightdale mm -hmm. or out to Garner, these corridors are filling up with small businesses all over the place. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what's happening is those markets are, one day that's going to look like Carrie looks today, right. like Apex looks right. today. Uh, so it, it's just fascinating because it, it's going to continue to happen. It's going to continue to sort, sort of, geographically spread out yeah, and businesses will keep filling in. It's good news. It's it all is. good news. Um, what's been one of the most interesting businesses that you've ever had to deal with for whatever reason that is? I mean, interesting because of industry or interesting God. just because of the mechanics to actually get this thing sold? Or interesting because I'm just a total nerd. I don't, <laughs> I don't know which one it would be. Self-identified. Yeah. I, <laughs> There's a couple of very interesting ones. I mean, one that people from this area will probably identify with pretty readily is, um, especially if you spent any time on the coast of North Carolina, which a lot of people here mm -hmm. have. Um, the Outer Banks, North Carolina is home to many places to get fishing tackle, but there is really only one that anyone well, not anyone, but most people go. And okay. that's TW's Bait and Tackle. Okay. Very well known. If you start looking around, you'll see people wearing their With shirts. shirts. I, like I crazy. actually immediately pictured shirts. Exactly. Yeah. So we sold TW's Bait and Tackle back in 2020. Oh, wow. And uh, just a fantastic company. Love the owner of that company. One of the most generous people I have ever met in my life. Um, very kind, very generous, you know, with a lot of things. Charity, but also just with his time and his wisdom. Um, so, you know, getting a chance to work with him throughout that process was very fun. I love fishing. So, mm -hmm. you know, we, we did a lot of fishing shoots and, you know, there was, there was a, it was a good, and when I say fishing shoots, I mean, uh, the marketing video that yeah. we created. Yeah. So we, yeah. we create like a video sort of like you would if you're showing a house mm -hmm. for every business that we sell. Uh, so we did that with this one. And, and so that was one that was just fun because I love fishing. There was another one in uh, Arden, North Carolina, so which is out towards the mountains. Mm -hmm. This was the nerdy one. Okay. So if you, you know, if you guys want to keep this great, <laughs> uh, if not, just <laughs> chop it right out. Um, so this one in Arden, North Carolina, what they did was take your catalytic converter. 
in a car. Okay. Right? So inside of your catalytic converter, there Which is... most people that have never driven a five-speed have no idea what, what a catalytic is. converter is. Exactly. They're going to go, you lost me, Eric. Yeah, I'm <laughs> done. But I got it, so it's fine. Good Let's job. keep going. That's right. So there's a, a catalytic converter inside of everyone's car. And inside of that catalytic converter, there is a ceramic honeycomb structure that they spray with these certain chemicals to reduce the noxious gases. Right, because if you've ever been in a car when the catalytic converter went out, you know how much it stinks. Oh my gosh, yeah. it's horrible. And yeah. it's, it's truly just bad for you. It's poisonous, right. right? And so if that catalytic converter is not there, you're just releasing poisonous gases into the environment. And so that honeycomb structure uh, that they spray with those chemicals, it's made out of this clay material. And to produce it or manufacture it, they extrude it through uh, basically a um, like a mold. Yeah. So the company that we sold, all they did, they're this only extruded plastics. Is it Nameco? No, no, no. Okay. So, so they didn't. They didn't actually extrude anything. Oh, okay. All they did was take those honeycomb structures after they had been manufactured and cut to length. They would take the excess pieces that were cut off in the manufacturing process, grind them down to a tiny particle size. You know, to like finer than sand, finer than salt, like mm -hmm. we're talking flour, and then put them in these big super sacks, which are just what they, you know, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a huge sack mm -hmm. and sent them back to the manufacturer. And they were doing very, very well doing and that. Because they could reuse the material? Exactly. Okay. The manufacturer so the could waste take it. could be created and new materials. Okay. That's right. All so right. It, was just, it was just recycled. And so again, not, not uh, what we not would call a sexy business. No, not yeah. at all. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a, just a really interesting business because you just there's so many things that fly under the radar that nobody even yeah. thinks about that you can make a business out of. Right. Um, and that's that's what I find fascinating. I, yeah, I agree. I mean, and, and I love talking about entrepreneurship and you know people that potentially have that entrepreneurial spirit, mm -hmm. but don't necessarily have something that they're passionate about. They're just passionate about business. Yeah. And that sounds like a really great match. So if I'm that person, if I'm just passionate about business, I want to get into business for myself, I wanna, you know, use my inherit whatever that is how do they how do you vet the business uh potential buyer what does that look like or yeah. is that part of the process that you're involved in well first thing i'd want to say about that is if you are someone who's entrepreneurial but you don't know what you would do to start and you have a decent amount of capital built up and you want to do something buying a business is such a great option mm -hmm. because you're buying Somebody's already done the the very difficult the blood, work sweat, and tears of making right? sure that this whole idea that they had is going to actually work. Right? They've proven it. Mm -hmm. They've made sure it works. And so, buying a business is such a great option for entrepreneurial people who don't necessarily want to start something on their own. Um, and then, how we are looking at those buyers, there's a, a couple different ways. One, we want to know that somebody is really serious. Buying a business is a very, very serious step. It's not easy to run a business. Being a business owner is extremely stressful. And there's people in the market that say they want to buy a business, but they don't necessarily really want to, or they don't really know what that means mm -hmm. necessarily. So that's the first thing. And you know, we're just addressing that, are these people serious about buying a business? And the reason that's so important is for a seller, the person selling the business, to open up the fact that they're selling the business and also their personal information is a big deal as well. Right. So we have to protect that information. So we're making sure they're serious. The second piece is we're making sure that what they're telling us makes sense. So if they say they want to move to the Raleigh area, we go, okay, fantastic. Where do you live now? Well, I live in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Do you have kids in school? Yeah. Does your wife know that you're looking for a business? Well, we've sort of talked about mm. it. Yeah, it's it's mm -hmm. that sort of thing, right? So we qualifying questions exactly yep. we want to make sure they're really ready, um, and then it's a financial check. Do they have the money to truly get the deal done? Um, and that's generally done through a SBA loan program mm -hmm. where they put roughly fifteen percent down on a, a business acquisition. Yeah. Yeah. And do you have those lending um, connections as well? So if somebody's coming to you and they don't have, you know, especially after this last year and just what the SBA and, um, you know, the loans that were given out due to the pandemic, what how do you connect them with that? Or do you have those resources? We do. We've actually got a great local company that we work with that we have a 
awesome relationship with. That's Diamond Financial Services. Uh, they're right off Six Forks, cool. and uh, the the owner there, Steve Mariani, does an excellent job. Awesome, and you know. Given that you were in the business uh, the last five years and you got to see what the pandemic potentially did to impact not only Midstreet, but business owners or potential business owners, maybe people that were right in the middle of a business acquisition, what, what, what did that year look like for you and how did that impact you know, what you guys do? It was a scary year for a lot of people. Um, for for many reasons that for business reasons the reason it was scary is you know we had a lot of customers whose businesses were heavily affected and it, it, it may sound you know you may think of business as you know well it's your company but for a lot of these people it's more than their company it's, it's their, their life. life yeah you know it's it's a huge deal it's how they do everything right and they, and their their whole net worth is tied up in the business so for for many of them it was a very difficult year some of our clients actually had a breakout year. Mm -hmm. You know, they had a better year than they ever could have imagined. And and that would be if you build pools. (laughs) The the last year was a really great year for pool builders. Mm -hmm. If you um, sell fishing tackle, right? TW's bait and tackle, they had a huge year because everybody was heading out to the beach. They wanted to be outside. Boat sales have been Boat sales, unbelievable. Hot tubs. Hot tubs through the roof. (laughs) You know, so there are certain businesses that have done really well and then certain businesses that were hurt. But uh, the SBA 7A program, the loan program that we use to sell businesses actually did a really great job of providing incentives to sort of keep people who were in the middle of acquiring a business in the game, you yep. know, keep them feeling like it was going to be okay, and then also extend um, support for those who needed it, for businesses that needed the support, and also incentives for people looking to still buy a business, right, just right. to help that market continue. Because it's very important that founders who are ready to sell their companies have a way to transition the ownership mm-hmm. so the business can continue to operate. I think we all heard so many headlines about these SBA loans and and these forgiveness loans, and we forget that there are real people that are associated with a lot of that. Um, it's not just all headlines. Um, it was it was definitely an interesting experience. And, you know, so many of our um, agents are 1099 employees. So, you know, being involved in that, not only to help them individually, but to help the business and everything. So, um, yeah. And the thing that people also that goes unseen about that is when the pandemic began, everybody was scared. Yeah. Everybody was concerned and had no idea what was going to happen. And so I definitely have clients who said, look, did we wind up needing that money? Thank goodness. No. Right. But we had no idea when the pandemic hit, whether we would or not. Right. And so we, we applied for it. We got it. And it was also forgiven. Anybody in that position would have done the same thing. Yeah. So I, I do understand where people are coming from. I mean, there are, there are absolutely people out there who did take advantage of that program, and that's unfortunate. But most, I would say, people really did need the help, and we're trying to do the right thing. I agree, and I think it will come back into the economy because it kept those businesses running, and maybe they were able to expand or grow and, and really put that money to use. Um, given all of that, and the exposure that you've seen, where do you see Midstreet as an organization um, continuing to help our local economy? And what what do you see for our triangle market? Like, where do you see us going in the next five years? I see the triangle market being just a, a massive growth market over the next 20 years, you know, and even beyond that. Nobody's got a crystal ball. No. You know, we can't we can't say for sure, but I I absolutely see all of the makings for an extremely fast growing area and this this you know, buy your homes now when you can to kind yeah. of you, you know, that that's what I'm thinking at least. It's it's going to get pricier, it's going to get busier. Uh, and those are good things, right? The, the economy itself is going to continue to grow, but yeah. the area will also change over yeah. that period of time. I think that's an important message for those that are in real estate Uh, in terms of being a buyer or seller. And it's something that we work to educate our clients on is that even though it feels inflated or it feels that things are moving too fast and there's too much volatility, there is so many indications that says that our market will maintain that resiliency. Because even in 2008, we really did not see what the other co- other markets in the country saw in terms there, of our housing market. Um, there so, are still markets from 2008 that haven't recovered. Right. I mean, Detroit's a good example. It's I a mean, great that, example. That market has barely recovered, and you know, God bless them. I hope they get 
they, they get more recovery, mm-hmm. but you're right. In 2008, the Triangle area, did we get hit? Yeah, we got hit, mm-hmm. but it wasn't like the rest of the country. We're a little bit insulated here. And I think what I said earlier about those universities and the school systems and just the sort of fever to get to this area is driving a lot of that. Yeah, I agree. Well, this was great. Thank you so much for coming in. Uh, It definitely applied so much to what our clients and our agents love to hear, which is that the Triangle is a great place to live. So I appreciate it, Eric. Thank you for coming in. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Making Moves. We want to deliver the highlights of the Triangle that you want to hear. Let us know your feedback, comment on our social media, like, and of course, subscribe to continue and discover why we love where we live. Until next time with Making Moves, hosted by the Rachel Kendall team.